this is following on from the workshop we had last week around clean air and now we are starting a five-part series on the global plastics treaty itself uh, my name is Niven Reddy. I am the Africa Regional Coordinator. and I will be the moderator for today's session. So just getting into it, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers for today. Um, we have two panelists joining us today. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we have Anna, um, who is... Um, Anna Rocha from Tanzania, who's joining us. I will give everyone a, a much bigger introduction in a minute. Uh, and Marissa um, from South Africa joining us. Um, but before we get into the speakers, I'd just like to do some basic housekeeping. Um, next slide. We do have interpretation available for today's session. Um, so if you click on the interpretation function, you will be able to access this webinar in French or English. Um, and with that, I'd like to maybe just get straight back to our speakers. Um, so Marissa Naidu is Gaia and BFFP's Africa Plastics Campaigner. She has a background in marine microplastic pollution and has previously worked in youth advocacy and campaigning for marine protected areas in Africa and across the globe. Uh, Marissa joined the team in February, 2022 and is based in Durban, South Africa. Thanks for joining us, Marissa. And we have Anna. Anna is an environmentalist who serves as an amplifier of voices from the Global South um, to global engagements. She is Brazilian and has been permanently living in Tanzania since 2010 and very much part of our Africa team, even though with a global mandate. Um, Anna became an activist as a child during Rio 92, the Earth Summit, and built over 30 years of local, national, regional, and global advocacy. She is a zero waste implementer and plastics advocate with over 15 years of service in grassroots organization, aiming to create positive systemic change in the waste sector and built the foundation for a socially just and climate resilient world. Anna is Gaia's director of the Global Plastics Program, providing leadership and strategic vision to Gaia's international plastics policy work. Thank you for joining us, Anna. Um, and before we dive straight in, um, we would like to take this opportunity to just uh, invite everyone to please put on your camera so we could take a picture. So. If you follow us on social media, you know we love a good social media post. And this is the opportune moment for that. So uh, we're gonna stop sharing screen. And if you could, uh, yeah, just put your camera on for a minute and then you'll see yourself on Instagram and Facebook a bit later. Good to see you all. Okay, is anyone ready to take pictures? Okay, think we're good. Great, thank you everyone. Good to see so many people here. Um, and then just getting back to our program, with that, um, we're gonna go straight in. And I'd like to hand over to Marissa Naidu, who's gonna kick us off. Thank you so much, Niven, for the introduction. Um, and uh, it's great to see so many amazing people in this room. Um, uh, good day, everyone. It's a pleasure to be presenting to you today um, the overview of the plastics crisis and how the Global Plastics Treaty Instrument can serve us well to address this problem and to shift the narrative on plastic pollution. Next slide, please. Okay, so as I said, I would be starting off by presenting to you an overview of the plastics crisis. Next slide, please. 
To begin with, it is important for us to recognize the magnitude of the plastics crisis. There isn't a single place on planet Earth where plastic cannot be found. Today, it has even begun finding its way into the human bloodstream as well as our lungs, making us believe that we are living in the age of plastics. From the time we wake up until the time we go to sleep, we've included plastic in somehow or the other in our routines. It has so much so become an inescapable part of the material world, flowing from every experience of human beings in everything from plastic bottles to bags, even the clothes we wear on our bodies. From mountaintops to the depths of our oceans, plastic is simply everywhere. Next slide, please. The current reality of the plastic crisis is this. It is projected that under business as usual scenarios, by 2060, the use of plastics could almost triple globally. While OECD countries are projected to double their plastic use, the largest increases are expected in emerging economies in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. Plastic waste is also projected to almost triple by 2060, with half of all plastic waste still being recycled, sorry, with half of all plastic waste still being landfilled and less than a fifth being recycled. Plastic leakage to the environment is projected to double to 44 million tons a year, while the buildup of plastics in aquatic environments will more than triple, exacerbating environmental and health impacts. Next slide, please. But who do you think is to blame for this continuous mass of high mass production and consumption? Is it you and I, or is it something bigger than us? Nearly all plastics up to 99% are made from fossil fuels. That is oil, gas, and coal extracted from oil fields and fracking drill pads belonging to multinational petrochemical giants whose agenda to flood the world, its oceans, rivers, agricultural soils, and even our desirability with plastics have been successfully achieved in the name of convenience and progressiveness. As the world looked towards energy transition, renewable power, and making the grid greener, oil and gas companies are getting nervous. That is why fossil fuel giants are looking towards petrochemicals and in particular plastics. Currently 6% of the total oil production is used by the plastic sector and it is estimated that this will come to represent 20% by 2050. Next slide please. If we were to examine production use production use and disposal. They reveal a multitude of health and environmental effects at every stage of the plastics life cycle, whether caused by plastic itself or by additives and processing. The following is a brief overview of just some of those impacts. It has been said that if the life cycle of plastics were a country, it would be the fifth largest greenhouse gas emitter on earth, contributing negatively to the climate crisis. Let's take a deeper look at every phase of the life cycle. If we look at the extraction phase, once fossil fuels, that is oil and gas, is extracted, infrastructure, including pipelines, transports raw materials to refineries or directly to the market and can release hundreds of toxins during pumping or piping feedstocks, which can cause a wide range of effects that include damage to sensory organs, such as the skin, the eyes, effects on bodily systems, including respiratory, nervous, and gastrointestinal systems. It has also the potential to increase the likelihood of cancer, neurological, reproductive, and developmental problems, and impairment of the immune system. At the production phase, in order to produce plastics, Raw feedstocks, which is oil and gas, have to be turned into long repeating chains of molecules like ethylene and propylene. They are then combined and processed to incorporate chemical additives, which are then molded into plastic pro products. During the production phase, emissions are released that can cause further health impacts, such as impacts to the reproductive and developmental problems, cancer, as well as genetic impacts like low birth weight. 
Fence line communities that are located close to production sites and workers employed in the production sector or facilities are impacted by the daily threat of toxic exposure, potential accidents, and even incidents of death. At the consumption phase, using post-consumer goods, people are exposed to the toxic impacts of plastics, microplastics and hazardous chemicals that are used in plastic products can contaminate surrounding environments, including air, water, food, and enter the bodies of animals as well as human tissue. The inhalation and or ingestion of microplastic shedding from products and hazardous additives leaching out of plastic products can severely affect human health. Hundreds of substances are used in plastic products, including substances of concern that are known or suspected carcinogens and chemicals that impact development, fertility, and the endocrine system. At the waste phase of the life cycle of plastics, only a small fraction of plastic waste can be economically or technically viable to recycle, representing a mere 10% of plastic that has ever been produced. Waste blocks drainages, leading to floods, is unappealing and can trap animals. Waste is also dealt with in a way of dumping or burning and is not really most of the time collected. In fact, the waste industry in richer countries also often transports plastic waste to poorer countries to be dumped there in a concept known as waste trade or what we call waste colonialism. In this way, the vast majority of our plastic waste ends up in the environment by a landfill, marine or terrestrial litter, and a smaller percentage is burned. All of these methods result in the release of toxic chemicals, organic substances, acid gases and other toxic substances into the air and soil, leading to severe health and environmental impacts. In summary, plastic pollutes at every stage of the life cycle, from the wellhead where oil and gas is extracted, through its production and consumption waste, consumption and post-consumer waste. Next slide, please. Previous slide. To contextualize this pl the plastic problem in Africa, we are not indifferent to the plastic crisis that is faced by the rest of the world, but Africa has not stopped its fight against plastic. Out of 54 African states, 34 have either passed a law banning plastics and implemented it, or have passed a law with an intention of implementation. Of those, 16 have totally banned plastic bags. The majority of African countries are not net producers of plastics, yet meet a multitude of challenges, including lack of resources, technological and financial capacity to manage the various aspects relating to plastic pollution. Our landfills, soil, water resources, and air we breathe are being heavily polluted by plastics. Africa's sovereignty is also undermined by toxic and non-recyclable plastic waste exports in the form of waste colonialism. These challenges are further compounded by cross-border smuggling, inadequate national capacity to monitor and enforce bans, thriving black markets, structural and instrumental power of the plastic industry, intensive lobbying by powerful private sector key players, weak institutions, top-down policy approaches, corruption, lack of regional cooperation, and little to no incentives for alternate delivery systems. Next slide, please. Whilst we have heard about the plastic crisis and its injustices, how do we address this problem? The UN is negotiating a treaty that could solve the problem. And here's what you need to know about this process. Next slide, please. In a very short video that I'm hoping will provide you a good overview of the treaty, um, if we can just get that started and you're welcome to listen in. What do Exxon, Green what do Exxon, Greenpeace, and Rwanda have in common? The answer might surprise you. A lot of people don't know this, but right now, 175 countries are negotiating a treaty to solve plastic pollution. And there are a lot of players in the room. 
let's break it down. We all know about the plastic problem at this point. It's a problem so big that no country alone can solve it. So last year, global talks began to forge an international plastics treaty. It's a big deal, but an even bigger deal is that countries agreed it'll be legally binding. That means if governments don't abide by it, there could be actual consequences. And now, world leaders are meeting periodically to negotiate the terms of the agreement. But the devil's in the details, and this is where you're gonna come in, so pay attention. We need a plastics treaty that, one, has deadlines to slash plastic production. Ending the cycle of plastic pollution for good requires getting to the root of the problem by cutting plastic production. See, the plastics crisis is fundamentally a crisis of volume. There's so much plastic being created right now that it's just totally unmanageable. Basically, if you've got an overflowing bathtub, don't bail it out with a teaspoon, turn off the faucet. Two, we need a plastics treaty that advances environmental justice. We need this treaty to prioritize the health, livelihoods, and expertise of communities and workers all along the plastic supply chain. Look, we know plastic harms people. The fossil fuels and chemicals it's made of are toxic, and they pollute our air, our water, our food, and even our bodies. So those most impacted, whether they live next to an ethane cracker in Pennsylvania or work as a waste picker in the Philippines, need to be at the decision-making table. Number three, we need a treaty that rejects false solutions. Major polluters like Exxon are lobbying for a weaker treaty, but why are the companies that created the problem even allowed in the room in the first place? And the things the industry is pushing, like what they call advanced recycling, or plastic offsets, or more beach cleanups, those are not real solutions. They're just greenwashing tactics that let industry keep making more plastic. With negotiations underway, we need to build enough public pressure around the world to make sure the treaty is strong enough to solve the problem. And we need to keep certain companies and countries from getting in the way. The good news is, many countries are advocating for strong terms. Let's call them the High Ambition Coalition. Nations like Rwanda and Ecuador and Norway and Peru, they're leading the way. Other countries, not so much. Some of the world's most powerful countries, like the US where I live and Saudi Arabia, they're resistant to passing a strong treaty because they're the major producers of either plastic or the fossil fuels that plastics are made of. So this is where you come in. If you've felt helpless or like my individual actions can only do so much, this is the opportunity for the major sweeping changes that we've been waiting for. But world leaders need to hear from us. We need participation from people like you and me to make sure we're drowning out corporate lobbying and getting the strongest possible plastics treaty we can. So what kind of treaty will the citizens of the earth get? The one we fight for. So I hope that was able to provide you with a good overview of where we're at. But how exactly did we get here? The Global Plastics Treaty has been a result of strong pressure that has been building globally for action on plastics for several years. At the international level, this has been part of ongoing discussions at the United Nations Environment Assembly, or UNEA, which is a group of countries that meets periodically every two years or so. As you can see from the timeline, between UNEA 1 and UNEA 4, we were still talking about the plastic pollution crisis as a marine litter problem. But let's go through it. At UNEA 1, we found ourselves agreeing on global emerging threats of plastic. At UNEA 2, we identified knowledge gaps and calls for global response considering the product life cycle approach. At UNEA 3, we recognized the inefficient global governance and established an expert group. And at UNEA 4, we were starting to strengthen international coordination and sharing of knowledge and extended the mandate of the expert group on marine litter and microplastics. Next slide, please. 
However, history was made at UNEA 5 in 2022. Again, we transitioned from restricting the plastic pollution crisis as a marine litter only problem to one that needed to be addressed across its full life cycle. As part of UNEA Resolution 514, we got a mandate for the world's first plastics treaty. UNEP requested the executive director to convene what is called an intergovernmental negotiating committee or INC to begin its work during the second half of 2022 with the ambition of completing its work by the end of 2024 for a strong and ambitious plastics treaty. Next slide, please. To summarize, the Plastics Treaty is an acknowledgement by governments that plastic pollution knows no borders, and therefore global coordinated action is needed. Given the failure of several voluntary initiatives and the severity of the plastic pollution crisis, the time could not be more ripe for a treaty. It has been five years in the making. It is going to be a legally binding treaty on plastic pollution that will aim to address the entire life cycle of plastics. It is negotiated between governments and we as NGOs and civil society remain as observers that are able to make suggestions um, but cannot directly oppose or propose text. The institutional makeup of the treaty is still underdetermined, but it could comprise of a mix of global obligations and national action plans. Once the treaty is finalized, countries will have the option to ratify it or not. If they do, there's an opportunity to strengthen and harmonize national regulations to combat plastic pollution towards a global common goal based on global common ground. Countries also remain free to legislate additional or more ambitious controls. And with that, I would like to end my presentation and thank you for your attention. And I will now pass the mic back to Naveen. Thank you, Marissa, for that amazing overview of the severity of the plastic crisis itself. Um, quite a big problem we have at hand and you know, just showing us the pathway to which we now are approaching this plastics treaty. Um, and before we go on to Anna, who's gonna take us a little bit more deeper into the plastics treaty itself, um, this is just a reminder that uh, we do have French interpretation. So you can see the interpretation function below and shift over to French if you'd like to access that. And just a reminder, if you do have any questions for Marissa, um, to please put them in the chat. We will have a Q&A session after this. And as Anna does her presentation, if any questions do come up, please do put that in the chat. And with that, um, Anna, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Niven. Uh, um, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, very, very honored to talk about um, the Plastic Treaty. And I am here <laughs> as the director of the Global Plastic Program for Gaia, trying to get you all excited and interested about the plastic treaty. That means getting people excited about policy, which you can imagine is not necessarily the most exciting topic in the world. So I'm hoping that I will succeed um, and make you be able to make you see how important policy can be in other areas as well, as well of our work and how uh, we can engage in meaningful ways. Uh, that can also be fun, by the way. So, uh, next slide, please, um, Carissa. So, as uh, Marissa mentioned, and I think I, I always like to, to start my presentation with this slide, because um, we are actually all very excited um, about the opportunity to discuss a global plastic treaty. Uh, when the resolution uh, 514 at UNEA 5.2 was actually um, agreed to, um, this had um, coverage all over the world, as you can see. So this is a little bit of the coverage that we had, and it was a very emotional moment for everyone that has been working on plastics for a long time, and for everyone that has been advocating uh, for a treaty to happen for a long time. Um, one important thing for us to acknowledge here is the fact that if we have a plastic treaty being discussed right now, it is because civil society was powerful enough to put pressure 
um, to advocate for it and to get member states to discuss it and to take it beyond marine litter. And so this is actually a huge uh, civil society victory. Even the mandate to have a treaty as a civil society uh, is a civil society win. Um, and that can only be extended now, hopefully, by the actual treaty negotiations, uh, which, are, which I'm going to go through um, with you right now. Next slide, please. Um, so when you talk about the UNEA you know, 514 resolution, we are talking about basically a very short document. It's about three pages. Uh, so what is it about this document that is so important and that deserves us all spending this much energy and time on? Uh, next slide, please. So if you think a little bit about how the process came and Marisa covered the process until we got to a plastic treaty. So we got to, to, uh, to the point that we are right now of having resolution. Uh, but then after the resolution was actually adopted and um, during UNEA 5.2, we actually also had an ad hoc open-ended working group that happened in Senegal in May, 2022. Um, and that was basically, and I'm going to go through this in detail a little bit um, um, later, uh, but that was basically to discuss how the treaty was going to be negotiated. And then we are in the intergovernmental negotiation committees, and that those are the INCs. So we mo you must all have heard about the INCs. And we are supposed to have from INC 1 to INC 5. This is ongoing. We are approaching now INC 3, uh, which is going to be in Nairobi in November. And then at the end of the treaty, there is a moment that we need to have um, basically the people that have the power to sign uh, the resolution on, on behalf of a country. Um, and so that's the Diplomatic Conference of Plenipotentiaries. That's where the Plastic Pollution Treaty will be adopted. Um, the initial timeline said that that was going to happen in mid-2025. Um, that may be adjusted. So we're going to see um, how that's going to go. Next slide, please. So those three pages documents that I just showed, uh, they basically give you a, a mandate for this resolution. So when you think about the mandations and the resolution basically said environment, uh, the second part of the, the nature of the intended outcome. And we are talking about an internationally legally binding instrument that's in the resolution. Um, then the mandate must, say what type of provisions to include and what the resolution says is which uh, which could include both binding and approaches and then the last part of the mandate is that before for the INCs and then the plenipotentiaries conference happens in 2025. So the resolution basically gives us the framework for an ambitious treaty for ambitious negotiations and that's exactly why in that picture that we showed, you see everyone celebrating so much that moment because that resolution actually gives us um, a framework to do the work that we need to do now to push for a strong treaty. Next slide, please. Um, the resolution and, and the mandate, they also um, give us a little bit of an insight on the size and severity of the problem, the urgency that we have to strengthen global, global governance and take immediate action. Uh, we are not talking about a treaty that is supposed to be implemented in 50 years from now. We are talking about a treaty that should be implemented uh, gradually. Um, and is starting. And they also should talk about the need for sci a science policy interface. So we need to have a scientific body um, as part of the treaty. Domestic and trans uh, transboundary nature of the, of the plastic uh, crisis. We need to remember that plastic travels both as plastic waste and as plastic products. Um, it travels all over the world. So we cannot think about this at the national level. Um, we are talking about uh, trade as well. We are talking about the full life cycle of plastics. And we are also recognizing the role of NGOs, waste pickers, and the private sector. 
Um, so we are basically recognizing that the observers, which, which I don't really like to call observers because it's a kind of a passive word, but that's how um, UNEP um, refers to NGOs and to all the civil society groups. Um, we, we have a role in advocating for this treaty and that is also recognized. Next step, next slide, please. And then something that is important, I think, for everyone in this call is that the treaty also the resolution and now the treaty and negotiations are also approaching the human rights dimension of the problem. When you're talking about, we are talking about plastics, you're not talking about uh, a material that doesn't impact people. We are talking about a material that has very high impact on people. Um, and that includes people that are working in the waste sector, so waste pickers, for example. Uh, that includes indigenous peoples that have their livelihoods threatened um, by plastic pollution and also by plastic production. And we are talking about health. And all of these um, human rights dimensions are included in that resolution. Also, when the Rio Declaration um, is actually mentioned. And principles 1, 3, 10, 20, and 22 of the real, uh, the real resolution, the real declaration that is mentioned there is the fact that we are talking and recognizing that we need to address the, the plastic crisis for the future generations as well. Next slide, please. So what I think is the most important part of this discussion and this conversation that we are having is that when we are talking about the plastic treaty, we are not just talking about a policy forum where we have countries, um, delegates representing their countries negotiating text. The plastic treaty has many more dimensions to it. And that's one of the reasons why it's important for everyone to get involved. So there are basically three big circles um, that overlap, but they also have um, the opportunity to both um, get it stronger through, through the treaty and also influence the treaty. Next slide, please. And so the negotiations for me at, at the center, this is the center um, of the treaty, yes, but it's also the smallest part of the treaty in a way because the negotiations, they need to relate to two other pieces, which are the movement building and the national level policy advocacy. Um, when you think about movement building, we're talking about how we can all connect, how can we all work together, and how can we make sure that the plastic treaty results in a civil society advocating against plastic pollution that is stronger after the treaty than it was in the beginning of the treaty. We are talking about all the alliances that we can build, all the movement that we can build, um, how we can basically work together and make sure that we can advance our demands forward during the negotiations, but also at the national uh, level and at the regional level. And those things end up influencing the outcome of the treaty as well as um, being a pillar on their own. Um, one of the things that we need to remember is that during the negotiations, there is um, likelihood that we have amazing texts coming out of the treaty that are going to be important for us to push national and regional um, advocacy, but we may also have complicated tasks coming out of the treaty. The truth is that the good text that is coming out of the treaty is only going to be implemented at the national and the regional level if we then influence our governments to do so. Um, and all the bad portions that the treaty might have in terms of um, text can only be blocked at the national and the regional level, if we all work together for that to happen as well. So at the end of the day, us working at the national and the regional level and also um, making sure that we are getting stronger as a movement as we go is, in my opinion, the most important part of the treaty. Next slide, please. So when you think specifically about Africa, one of the things that we need to remember is that the treaty uh, came from the Rwanda-Peru resolution. So Africa from the very uh, beginning of all this uh, process has been a fundamental player um, in the global plastic treaty. So we had these two countries, Rwanda and Peru, actually drafting a resolution that then originated the UNEA 514 resolution. Um, we have been 
uh, we have had a protagonist role from the beginning and we continue to have that protagonist role. Uh, one of the things to say is that the African group of negotiators um, has several times the most ambitious um, mandates, demands for the treaty. And so it's it's interesting to see how Africa can basically shape uh, the form that the treaty is going to take. Next slide, please. And there are several opportunities for advocacy with that. So basically the treaty creates a framework for us to address historical inequality and double standards, which we know that our region has been suffering from um, since ever. Uh, demand a ban on waste trade in alignment with the Basel Convention. We also know that, that, that waste colonialism is something uh, very important for our region that we need to fight against. Um, it also gives us a framework to support human rights and social justice demands, including um, the inclusion of waste speakers in the treaty, but also indigenous populations and other groups. Uh, push for important legally binding agreements that create accountability for plastic and oil producing countries. Africa is not the main producer of plastics globally. As we all know, uh, we do have a lot of plastics coming to the continent. Um, in the form of products, in the form of waste as well. And so we need to make sure that the, the oil producing countries and the plastic producing countries actually um, have basically sent uh, product, uh, plastic products, ensure that the full life cycle of plastics is addressed. That's one of the most important portions of the treaty and then promote sustainable production and consumption as well. Next slide, please. So if we think about the, glo the Global Plastic Treaty, what you're talking about is how global policy can be a tool to influence national policy. Um, that means that we can advocate for the domestication of global agreements at the, at the national level. That means that we can, as I said, build movement, influence, and capacity. That means that we can support the global South leadership in this whole process. And that also means that we can use national policy as a baseline for global policy, and it spotlight ambitious national and regional solutions. And we have many in Africa. Um, Africa has 34 countries that have some, some sort of restriction um, to plastic. So have um, basically legislation that restricts um, plastics and we can actually use those as a baseline for the discussions. Next slide, please. So then thinking a little bit with more detail with the treaty process um, timeline, as we mentioned already, it started in March 2022, um, followed by with the UNEA resolution. And then we have the open-ended working group uh, in May 2022, going to INC1 that happened in Uruguay in November 2022. INC2 just happened in May 2023 um, in Paris in France. And then we now have INC3 coming up in Nairobi. Um, and then INC4 is going to be in Canada, and it says here May 2024, but at this point, um, as of now, it's actually going to be April 2024, and somewhere between October and November 2024, we have INC5 and uh, the Republic of Korea. And then what's likely going to happen that is not confirmed yet is that we may have a couple, at least one more INC. So this timeline may be extended. It hasn't been so far officially extended, but that's what it seems like is going to happen. Um, and then after that, you have the conference of the plenipotentiaries um, to adopt the treaty. Next slide, please. So on INC1 and INC2, um, a little bit of an overview of what happened there. One, um, at INC1, it started with the definition of the essential elements to be included in the negotiation. That's basically defining what topics are going to be negotiated. And then a long discussion on the rules of procedure. So when you think about the rules of procedure, we are talking about basically um, the rules that of how, for how the negotiation is going to happen. How can countries basically like the treaty to be? Um, I think you, many of you have heard already about the discussion, for example, about cons consensus versus voting. Uh, so this is part of the discussion of the rules of procedure. 
bigger, but the rules of procedure is bigger than that. So that's basically the rules by which the treaty um, is negotiated. And then from that, we entered the development of an option, options paper that had core obligations and means of implementation that happened before INC2. And that's basically what, what was discussed at INC2. After INC2 and those discussions, we had then the mandate for the development of a zero draft, uh, which just happened that was released about a week and a half ago. And the zero draft is basically a document that, that has all the options that have been discussed during INC2 in it. And it's basically um, the basis for the negotiations that are going to happen at INC3. So it's basically the text that the uh, member states, the delegates are going to be looking at and saying, okay, I would like this paragraph to stay. I would like this paragraph to be modified. I would like this uh, paragraph to be excluded from the text. So that's basically what the zero draft is. And we also had at INC2, a call for submissions um, and the, those submissions were covering the scope, the principles, and the intersectional work that needs to happen uh, to be advance the discussions, to advance the negotiations with technical content um, so that we can actually um, accomplish the treaty within the proposed timeline. Next slide, please. Three. Well, INC3 is supposed to be the moment for us to advance the development of the instrument using the zero draft as a basis, as I just mentioned. Um, INC3 is probably also a moment in which the geopolitical alliances for the countries are going to be very clear and visible. So what countries are going to navigate this treaty together? I think we will have a very good sense of that during INC3. As you can imagine, we have um, plastic producing countries um, staying together um, and then countries that have higher ambition, especially in relation to the reduction of plastic production also gravitating together. But there are other um, less obvious geopolitical alliances that also happen. Um, hopefully also have a possible mandate for to prepare the first draft, which is basically the second um, version of the zero draft define the modalities and timelines for the intersectional work, as I mentioned, and then draft an agenda for INC4 that happens um, in um, um, Canada, and a possible agreement, as I mentioned, for an extension of the treaty initial, uh, treaty's initial timeline. Next slide, please. So we have been working together for some time now to, to develop basically the Africa CSO priorities. Um, I'm not going to detail all of this, but just to mention, um, for Africa, we definitely need to make sure that we address the full life cycle of plastics. So that has been an agreement, I think, from for most of the Africa CSO groups. Um, and then we are also trying to cover sustainable production and consumption, limit the presence of toxic chemicals in plastics, um, both in the, in the continent, but also um, ensuring that we have chemical transparency. So basically mandating um, plastic producers to um, be transparent about the, adi uh, the adjectives and all the components of the plastics that they produce. Just transition um, clearly uh, is, a, is a priority for Africa. And then there are several discussions about EPR, extended producer responsibility. Um, we also are trying to push for upstream measures exactly because if you think about Africa, we are not big producers. So we are the ones who should be uh, pushing for upstream measures and make sure that we address plastic production. Next slide, please. Um, and that includes, again, the inclusion of white speakers, indigenous peoples, um, indigenous knowledge as well, which is an important um, underrepresented African countries, women and youth. And the, all the social aspects and the human rights aspects um, should be included in the treaty. And also there is a lot of um, eagerness to have a treaty finance mechanism uh, that is that can basically finance the implementation of treaty in countries that, are, that don't have um, the, the money to do that, to the funds to do that. Next slide, please. And then if you are, um, especially if you are a member of BFFP, you should also be uh, hearing a lot about enforcing reuse and refuel models. And that's something that we have been discussing a lot. Promote traditional systems, address microplastics as well. 
Um, there are many conversations about circular economy. Um, we are emphasizing the need of that circular economy to be non-toxic. There is um, appetite uh, to discuss technology transfer. And so basically how we do that, um, scientific knowledge, um, all the linkages with climate um, and all of that. And then there are conversations about the alternatives to plastics um, and how that shapes. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, the treaty is happening because of the power of civil society. We have uh, the ability to make this conversation relevant. And next slide, please. For Gaia and the FFP members, we, like Gaia and the FFP, we, we offer support for everyone who would like to get engaged. Um, that support including regional mapping, regional strategies, the commitment to provide opportunities for member engagement, the development of, an, of advocacy tools and content that um, organizations that people can use, deep and simplified analysis of the treaty content and also the provisions in the treaty, capacity building for both civil society and member states, um, global south specific communication that basically um, has a narrative that we can relate to, and then the opportunity for coalition building and movement building. So if you would like, if you are not involved in the treaty as of now, and you would like to get involved, you have plenty of um, support to do so. So yeah, next slide, please. So I would like to end by saying that the treaty is happening. There is no way out. And what we need to make sure is that we make the most of it. Uh, the treaty will have impact in all the areas of work that we do. Um, and so we need to make sure that we basically make this impact positive. So that's it from me. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Anna, for that very detailed presentation and overview of the treaty and all the processes that come with it. And just to echo what you said, the treaty is happening. Let's make the most of it. Um, so with that, um, we have about 10 minutes left for questions. Um, so we'll take any questions. If you, if you have any questions, uh, maybe raise a hand or I haven't seen anything in the chat as yet. So um, yeah, you could raise a hand and you could ask it live um, to Anna or Marissa. Okay, we'll just wait a few minutes if anyone's typing. I'm happy to go ahead and start the process off. So maybe Marissa, I'll pose a question to you as how can civil society actors become more involved in this process? Thanks for that question, Niven. Um, I think Anna uh, mentioned it quite a few times around how we get in touch with our delegates and really pushing um, uh, pushing the power around engaging with our INC focal point. So I believe that civil society organizations have a very powerful voice and we can really use this voice to interact and engage with our delegates directly. Um, also to be able to shift the public narrative around the treaty. I think one of the important points that was mentioned um, in that video was mounting public pressure. So we cannot get anywhere without having um, you know, pressure from the public, buy-in from the public. And to be able to do that, we need to be able to create awareness around what is the plastics treaty, why does it matter, and why we need to buy into this. Um, so in terms of how we do that, um, I think firstly, learning what makes a strong treaty. So for those that are present here today, you're already on a journey towards learning around that. Uh, but also reading and understanding your country's submissions, um, what it means, um, their positions around the treaty, are there positive positions, are there blocking positions, can we be able to lobby um, around those positions, and organizing and demanding. The ways you can do this is by letter writing to your government's um, online uh, campaigns, uh, petitions, demonstrations, and just really talking to local media in order to get that public buy-in. So those are some ways um, I believe you can engage around the treaty and get involved. Um, and I'm always available to answer any questions um, and also pass on any resources um, that are relevant to the treaty. So I'll end with that. Thanks, Neven. 
Great. Thank you, Marissa. Um, we do have a hand, uh, Hemsing. Would you like to ask a question? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Niven. Well, I know that um, Gaia has submitted its views to the INC Secretariat, but uh, now that uh, the zero draft has come out, have we analyzed, for example, how much that we contributed and it is in the document, in the zero draft document? Have we, have we done this analysis? Thank you for your reply. I'm happy to come in on that one and maybe Anna, if you'd also like to. Um, so him saying within the plastics policy working group, we have started to analyze the uh, zero draft um, and a spoiler alert, but we will be having the second webinar on the 21st of September, um, where we will also be able to present uh, Gaia's um, analysis of the zero draft as well as BFFP's analysis of the zero draft. So this is underway and uh, we are working on analyzing it at this point. What I can say from uh, my perspective right now is that 80% of the zero draft as it stands um, is positive um, and it is language that we as African CSOs and CSOs in general want to see in the draft. There is a further 20% that is negative and there are options that counter um, our positions around the draft. So our position would really be to keep the 80% that is in there um, with our governments um, and, and, and not try to, to, to get that excluded. Um, so that is what I can say for now. There will also be um, another uh, event that will analyze the zero draft that is being hosted by SEJAD in um, collaboration with CL and, um, uh, sorry, in collaboration with CL on the 29th of September that will look at African civil society's analysis of the zero draft. So there's going to be quite a few um, uh, engagements around the zero draft in the coming weeks. And I will just encourage folks to keep an eye on their emails um, and any WhatsApp groups that you're also part of. Uh, maybe Thank Anna, you, Mary, you also have anything. Thank you, Marisa. That's very encouraging. 80%. Great. Thank you. Anything to add, Anna? Um, I would just add that this analysis of the zero draft is happening um, in several levels, um, especially when we talk about um, the guy engagement. So basically, we have the overall analysis of the draft, which is about what is positive and what is um, less positive or negative about it. But we also have regional analysis that are happening in Asia Pacific, in Africa, and in Latin America. And we are hoping to be able to see how, what are the overlaps um, of the regional priorities for um, the Global South region so far, Asia Pacific, Africa, and Latin America. So that we can, as Global South, advocate together uh, for all the overlapping uh, demands that we have. Great. Thank you both for your responses. And just to echo what Marissa said, if you want to know more about the, the zero draft itself, we will be having a session on that next week on the 21st, and we will be sending more details about the rest of the Plastics Treaty webinar series. So there will be sessions around financing and fault solutions as well coming up um, over the next few weeks. We do have another question from Alpha um, in the chat. So um, who is the main lead organizer of the Global Plastics Treaty? And what are the mechanisms of collecting opinions from different state and non-state actors, as well as communities? Um, Anna, I'm not sure if you want to have a go with that one. Yes, I can take that one. Uh, so basically, the main, uh, the convener, let's say, of the Global Plastic Treaty is UNEP, which is the UN Environment Program. Um, and then under the UN system, you have all the member states. So basically all the countries that are signatories of the UN uh, being part of that process. Uh, so basically what happens for people who haven't seen negotiations is that we have delegates from each one of the member states that are interested in this topic, um, getting together in a, in a large conference room and basically engaging in discussions. So the mechanisms that we have um, for collecting 
opinions. One, it's during the negotiations when we have those discussions, we have note takers. So everything that countries basically say um, gets recorded and then becomes, um, it's an official uh, note taking system that then informs uh, the writing of the resolution of the zero draft of everything that comes after. Um, we also have UNEP requesting for country submissions. Um, and so that's when countries prepare documents on specific topics and they, they send to uh, the UN in between the INCs. So when the negotiations are not happening, they are preparing these documents that are deadlines for submission and then they send these documents. Us as civil society representatives, we are also able to submit documents. So we have calls um, for sub submissions and we prepare documents that we can send. Obviously, our documents don't have the same weight as the country documents, but they also count and the countries also read our documents to prepare their documents. Uh, so the civil society documents, the observers' um, submissions, they happen um, at a shorter timeline than the member state submissions so that the member states can basically read our documents when they are preparing their submissions. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of an overview. And then... Someone asked here that I had seen as well in the chat that is connected is basically who signs um, the treaty, who signs. Um, and I would say that basically countries will have the opportunity to endorse the treaty, the treaty at the end. So that's where what happens at the conference of uh, plenipotentiaries. So we have country representatives going there and saying, I am going to ratify uh, this treaty. So I'm putting a signature on this. And then they need to basically take it back to the national level um, and instrumentalize it at the national level. Thank you, Anna, for um, for responding to the question above and perfectly pronouncing plenipotentiaries. Um, uh, we have a couple more questions, but we are almost at time, but so I just want to maybe if you would indulge us just in a few more minutes just to go through some of these questions. So one from Hamza, are there any specific areas where civil society can conduct research to support the treaty? Um, yeah, Marissa, Anna, maybe a 30 second response if possible. So um, I can just quickly maybe sit, uh, go into this. Um, I think what, one of the things we're trying to do is conduct research around the plastic laws in Africa. Um, so that we can track uh, the effectiveness and how this is being enforced. Um, but it also feeds into national plans once the treaty lands. Um, so I would say that that could be a potential area, but um, scientific research is what, what is really being looking looked for um, in terms of informing the treaty and informing control measures around the treaty. That scientific research on chemicals of concern um, as well as uh, plastics that can be phased out and um, as well as on financial mechanisms. So research in those areas, um, I would say, um, is, is sort of needed as well. I don't know if, Anna, you have any, any other uh, insights on that one. Um, I think there are uh, many areas, and Marissa just mentioned very important ones. Um, I think one of the things that we need to always remember is that the delegates that are there negotiating the treaty are not necessarily experts on each one of the topics that are being discussed. Honestly speaking, nobody, <laughs> none of us also can um, be an expert in all the areas that are being discussed. And so having research done and having uh, documents available for um, people to consult is extremely helpful, both for civil society, for us in our advocacy, but also for uh, the delegates. So that's why we tend to collectively produce documents that we can use uh, to inform negotiations. Perfect. Thank you both for your responses. There are some questions outstanding in the chat, but um, I would just like at this point to thank everyone for their participation. We will respond to the questions in the chat directly through email because your email addresses were on your registration form. Um, the slides, the recording will be shared with you. We will share that after the call, maybe by latest tomorrow. Um, I'd like to thank our presenters, Anna and Marissa. Thank you so much for all of your insights today. Our interpreters, Rachel, Natalie, thank you, our team, 
in the background making this happen. And thank you to all of you for taking the time to join the session with us. And as I mentioned, you know, this is one of us, one of a series of workshops around the plastics treaty. So do join us for the ones coming up around um, the zero draft, which is the most urgent one. Look out for an email around this with more details or follow our social media handles, which will also have uh, more information about the upcoming series. But with that, thank you so much, everyone. Um, hope you all take care and see you soon. Bye, everyone.